with liberty and justice for all. All righty. Uh, I'd also like to thank the KPAC team, the 1623 Studios, the Gloucester High School faculty and staff, the members of the National Honor Society, uh, the candidates, our audience, and our moderator for making this debate possible. For your information, there is a scanning code on the debate brochures that will lead to our website, which is presently under construction, but we hope to have that done very shortly. Um, if you'd like to get on a mailing list, there is uh, a sign-in sheet here, or just email me at my address on the brochure, and I'll sign you up. Our moderator this evening is Christine Delisio. Ms. Delisio is an attorney who lives in Manchester and serves on the Manchester Planning Board. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Christine Delisio. All right, there's lots of familiar faces. I was honored to be here for the primary for the mayoral date, so thank you for having me back. My name is Christine Delisio. I'm from Manchester, and I'm on the planning board, and I'm honored to be here tonight for the City Council Ward Forum. So thank you for having me. All right, so tonight's program will be broken down into three parts. The first part will be a series of five questions that were given to the candidates ahead of time. They had the opportunity to review them, and that's important because I think they all should be on the same page and be able to deliver thoughtful answers to all of you. The second part, will be, I'm sorry, first will be a one minute introduction from each candidate. Second will be um, five questions that were prepared ahead of time. And then the final portion will be, time willing, Q&A at the end. So when the opportunity comes, I will inform you of the time. But I would first like to introduce our candidates. And let's see, Ward 1, Marianne Boucher. <clears throat> sorry, sorry. Ward 1 also, Scott Memart. Scott Ward 2, Dylan Benson. Yeah. Ward 2, Daniel Epstein. Ward 3, Marjorie Grace. So Joe Orlando tonight is not feeling well, Mary Pat DeRosa, Ward 4 is not feeling well, and then finally in Ward 4, Frank Majata. Oh, 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 all right, all right, my apologies. All right, so we are going to get going. The first part of the program will be an introduction. Each candidate will have 60 seconds, and we are going to go in alphabetical order. The next portion we determined how the ordering of questions were going to begin, which was really easy. Mr. Scott chose number one, so we're gonna start to the left, and then we will go on to Marianne, and then the next question will begin with you, Marianne, and so forth, and we'll loop around. Make sense? Okay, all right, so let's get going. The first person to introduce themselves um, would be in alphabetical one minute, would be Dylan Benson. All right, well, thank you, uh, everyone, and thank you specifically to Clayton and the Cape Ann Political Action Committee for hosting this debate. I also want to thank Chris Christina for moderating tonight, and thank you all in the audience and those that are watching out there, including family that is here tonight. Uh, I lived in Ward 2 all my life. I am a lifelong resident of Gloucester, obviously. I went through the school system, ended up getting my GED going on to get my bachelor's degree from Salem State University, and then subsequently I have a master's degree and a master's certificate. For the last four years, I've worked for the city of Beverly, gaining real world and practical experience in local government. I'm ready to give back to my community. I'm ready to serve this community. This community has given me so much, including people in this room who have mentored me through the years. I wanna bring forward common sense solutions to the issues that we're going to discuss tonight. Thank you. All right, next in alphabetical order is Marianne Boucher. You have one minute. Good evening, all. I'd like to thank the organizers for hosting this event this evening, and I'd like to thank all of you for attending, as well as 1623 Studios. My name is Marianne Boucher, and I'm running for the Ward 1 City Council seat. I'm a lifelong resident of Gloucester, 
and have spent 61 of my 64 years in the Ward 1 district. My husband Steve and I have five grown adult children, three amazing granddaughters, and I'm happy to announce that a fourth granddaughter is arriving this spring. Uh, my, my daughter's over there saying, not me. Um, <laughs> Steve, Steve and I own and operate a local contracting company here in Gloucester, and my past work experience includes administrative assistant to the president of a home inspection firm. I was a sales representative for multiple home furnishing manufacturers based throughout the U.S. and abroad. I've worked for the Gloucester Public School System both in the classroom and as Gloucester's public, uh, excuse me, and as Gloucester's substitute coordinator. And one of my favorite positions was teaching an after school class to second, third, and fourth graders. I have volunteered for many organizations. I am over. Okay. Okay. Well, that's it. Thank you. Daniel, you are next. One minute. I'm Dan Epstein. I live up on Perkins Street with uh, my wife, who uh, is with my daughter, who's six at the Y now, at her swimming lessons, so they can't be here. Uh, I was born in Massachusetts. I grew up in Western Mass and Vermont. Uh, I went to college for Russian studies uh, for my undergrad, and then I did politics and government for my PhD. I've taught politics and government uh, for many years. And um, my wife and I, after our daughter was born, uh, we were living at that point in Texas where we had moved for my wife to get her PhD. And we decided, you know, it's time to move back to Massachusetts. And we knew that uh, Gloucester, we lived lots of places, seen lots of places. We knew that this is where we wanted to be. Uh, I love this community. We chose to live here after lots of other places. But I do see that we need more housing, more affordable housing here. I've seen already kids and families that my daughter has known in school have to move away because they can't afford to live here. And so making Gloucester welcoming for families that they can afford to live here and bring up their kids here, just as so many people have for generations and Dan. I myself want to do, is my top priority. Thank you, Dan. Mm -hmm. OK, next, Marjorie Grace, one minute. First of all, thank you for hosting this event. Thank you, Christine, for moderating um, into Gloucester High School in 1623. Um, I'd like to start by saying thank you to all of the candidates that are up here with me. It takes a great deal of courage and commitment to run for office, and I wish you all the best of luck, and no matter the outcome, Gloucester will benefit because each and every one of us offers something different. Um, I'd like to give a special thanks to Jason Higgs, who was the other Ward 3 candidate, and he's been very kind and gracious and deserves credit for his efforts for Ward 3. Um, I've been a lifelong resident of Gloucester. My daughter, Alexandra, um, I, I moved away for 10 years, came back, raised my daughter here. Uh, started out my career in banking a long time ago. Uh, worked down the South Shore, running a, a big branch um, in Dorchester, and I am currently a surgical technologist, uh, a job that I am extraordinarily proud of. Uh, where where <clears throat> every patient that is um, in the operating room, I treat as though they were my own family very conscientious, um, what is called a surgical conscience, uh, where, you know, integrity, honesty, to taking care of the people Marjorie. in front of me. And, you know, I don't have the, the glowing... Your one um, minute is up, Marjorie. Sorry about that. Sorry. <laughs> <sighs> yes, Francesco Margiotta. Yes. All <laughs> right. Pretty good. You're next, one minute. Yes, uh, I'd like to thank the Cape Ann Political Action Committee for hosting tonight, and thank you all for coming. Um, so I'm a son of a fisherman, born and raised in Gloucester. I have three small children, one in the Gloucester Public School System. I am the current Ward 3 counselor, and I, a year ago I moved into Ward 4. Um, I love Gloucester. I lived in the West Coast and in New York City, in Boston, and I wanted to raise my family here. Um, I love this city. I want to work hard for the, my constituents and to make, continue moving the city forward. And um, really, I just love being here. I love listening to people. And I really do care for um, everyone in Gloucester. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Last, Scott Menhard. You have one Thank minute. Thank you very much. And, and the same thanks to all of you for, for sponsoring this opportunity. My name is Scott Memhard. And I'm asking for your vote, re-electing me as the ward counselor in Ward 1. My experience and my perspective will best serve you as we work together and with City Hall. 
I've lived and worked in Gloucester for over 40 years. My wife, Martha Oakes, is the curator at the Cape Ann Museum and was born here. And our three children, Ian, Larry, and Marie, all went to East Gloucester, played local sports, attended college, and are all blessed to still live and work nearby. The eldest of our four grandchildren started first grade in the beautiful new East, East Veterans School on Webster Street, and I myself am a graduate of Amherst College. <coughs> As president of Cape Pond Ice Company for 40 years, where I work with my son Larry, I've weathered many challenges confronting Gloucester's groundfish industry, harbor planning, and land use. And before elected office, I also served our community as a director and as the president of the board of the Sawyer Free Library, of the Gloucester Unitarian Universalist Church, and the Cape Ann Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Memhard, that's one minute. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Does um, 1623 need to make any adjustments or we're good? Okay. Just use the microphone. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we're now going to move into our next section, which is some questions. Each candidate will have 90 seconds to answer the question with a 30 second follow up. At the beginning of the debate, we drew numbers. Mr. Memhart, we're going to begin. Nice and tidy, beginning with left, and so. You want to go ahead and st st set the stage and read the question first? Oh, I'm audience. going to read the question. Great. Absolutely. All right. Yes. <laughs> All right. The first question is: The state of Massachusetts has enacted an act mandating that municipalities enact multi-family zoning within one half mile of MBTA stations. The Gloucester downtown area is currently zoned for two-family by right. The new zoning would increase by right zoning to multifamily defined as three or more families and suitable for families with children. Municipalities that do not comply with the subject will be subject, I'm sorry, to the state withholding potential grant funding. Other communities are challenging the mandate because of the home rule charter, stating municipalities have exclusive rights over local zoning. What is your opinion on this issue? You have 90 seconds. Thank you. Uh, first, I, I, there may be a correction, but I believe that currently zoning uh, downtown does not allow um, two family by right, only in the case of conversions of existing families, not for new construction. <coughs> Mayor Verg has recently initiated an updated 2024 co comprehensive planning process, which is engaging the community to build on the 2001 Gloucester plan, that's 22 years ago, and recommended Gloucester housing production plan. And as Mayor Greg Verga has made clear, the 3A MBTA community zoning is currently the law of the state. We are mandated to create new Mass TOD, or Massachusetts multifamily zoning district, within the one half mile of either the MBTA downtown or West Gloucester Station. The uh, provision allows for greater residential density as long as other existing zoning and setback requirements are met. And it is a zoning mandate. It's not a building mandate, a zoning mandate. It should not be difficult for us in Gloucester to tailor our community conversions to two and three family units or more. It is an opportunity for us to create much more needed public transit, transit accessible housing to Gloucester, where folks don't need to rely on owning private cars to live and to work here. The MBTA, when it works, when it works, <laughs> has made a huge investment, most recently with a new $100 million drawbridge across the Anasquam, providing service and resources to Gloucester commuters and residents. That's and 90 seconds. The state has every right to encourage us to more fully utilize this infrastructure that they are providing. Thank you. I guess I'm gonna stop after you. Would anyone like a warning? I'm thinking that you've prepared and you know the time because we were gonna have a time, but I could give you a 15 second warning. Would people like that? Okay, so. Your should be running faster than all our questions. Much faster. No, so I'm gonna stop. This is the first question. So we have um, someone in the front row. Yep, you got it. So our assistant in the front will wave the card when there's 15 seconds left. And so yes. Okay. Does that sound good? That sounds okay. like a good idea. All right, so Marianne, you're next. 
Okay. Of course, elected officials are bound by city, state, federal law, and laws evolve. There have been state changes since the subject came to light last February, this past August, and more likely to come from federal. Unlike the comprehensive plan where the consultants suggest meeting in a box, the residents that I have spoken to with regard to the MBTA TOD overlay want meetings at the round table where the people most affected by the new law have a voice and are invited to that table. Zoning capacity not for production means what? Could a few take advantage of the by right or law or will there be a sudden surge in development? How will it affect our infrastructure? Roads, water, sewer, electric and more. Will any? How many new units will truly be affordable? The conditions, the tallies. And our, our community needs to be updated and discussed rigorously and publicly. There are so many unanswered questions. Um, we can say that this new law is not tied to the MBTA, but it's hard to disconnect when the two, ish, um, the two issues when both are in the title. The title of this new law, Multifamily by Right Zoning for MBTA Communities. MBTA reports published September and October conclude the state's major community issues about safety, reliability, cost, and more would not be remedied for the foreseeable future. Thank you, Marianne. Okay. Dylan. Thank you. Uh, that's a great question. And as I understand it, it's a mandate to zone, not a mandate to build. The city council is not in the business of building. City councilors are not builders. It's my belief, how creative can we get with the zoning? That's something I'm really trying to think about. How can we be creative here? I've heard that we are in intermediate compliance, meaning that our existing zoning contributes to our compliance. This law directly affects many in my ward, including many folks that I've met during this campaign. I'd like to do more listening, and I want to find ways where my ward can be part of this process, how they can contribute to this process. I'd like to do more listening as well. And how can we be, the other thing I want to know is how can we do this in a way that respects the unique character of our neighborhoods, respects the history of our community, and how can it positively affect smaller landlords, multi-generational families, and, that, and families that need extra income to help offset their mortgage. I look forward to learning that through listening, and I look forward to learning more through further discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Dan? Well, uh, a lot of people have been interested in this topic uh, that I've talked to when I've knocked on doors. And, um, you know, people are concerned about overbuilding, especially in Ward 2. Uh, and one thing is that Ward 2 is very densely populated with housing already. In fact, if we grandfathered in all of the illegal multi-unit housing, we might actually reach the same density that they want us to reach if we had it in Ward 2. Um, but I do approach this from the perspective that housing is too expensive in Gloucester for Gloucester families, and housing is too expensive in Massachusetts. For Massachusetts families in all the parts of Massachusetts where people want most to live. So we need to do something about that. And I respect that the legislature chose uh, a modality that would be connected to the market rather than just forcing new things to be built, uh, and also to public transportation, which I think is really important for our future in Massachusetts and Gloucester. Now, as far as changing zoning, you know, a lot of people just assume, well, this zoning is gonna have to be in Ward 2, where the main train station is, but why can't it be in West Gloucester? That's a place where we have a lot of zoning that's very restrictive in terms of large plot sizes for small houses and few families. And I think if there's a place that we could add more housing, it's not necessarily in the downtown, but in places like West Gloucester or East Gloucester, places where density is very low. Thank you. <coughs> Marjorie. Um, thank you. <laughs> 
Um, you know, I don't think anybody likes, anyone likes being told by Beacon Hill, um, you know, that you have to do something. And I can't hear you. Sorry, can I start my minute over? <laughs> um, you know, I don't think that anybody likes being told what to do by Beacon Hill, nor, you know, having the, the threat of grant losses being used as leverage. Um, but, you know, it is what it is at this point, and it, it is the law um, as it currently stands, and we have no choice but to figure out how to approach it and go forward with it in such a way that, you know, it protects Ward 2 and Ward 3 also, um, which, you know, falls within that, that um, the zoning mandate. Uh, going forward with it, it's important that, that it is done thoughtfully, it's done considerately, and that the neighborhoods that are there are, you know, they are respected. Um, we need to go forward with it to make sure that, that it's not overdeveloped, that we don't have opportunistic landlords, that uh, we find ways to ensure affordability, and that whatever it is built there, whether it's expansion of existing dwellings, accessory dwellings, or, <clears throat> excuse me, new development, that it, the aesthetics of Gloucester and of the area and open space and green space is a requisite. You know, if children can't safely play in their neighborhoods and that they call home, it's not really family oriented. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think that this, this whole process would have been better received if there had been better communication initially. Um, you know, there's a lot of convoluted stuff on the, um, the Gloucester website, a lot of information, but you know, it's 18 plus pages to read through and it's not necessarily user friendly. I think that if something was written that was more condensed, that, um, that would, could be presented to um, the public and so they could understand more that maybe, maybe there would be a little bit less opposition and more understanding. Marjorie. We done? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, Frank, you have 90 seconds. The 90 seconds go by pretty quick. Um, I do agree with, um, you know, being last year, I do agree with what, what Scott Dillon said. Again, it's a right to zone, not to build. And the important thing as I'm hearing is, you know, things are constantly changing with the state and it's us working together with the state and the city to work together to be able to create housing, which is a major issue, not just for myself, but for the older generation and the younger generation. How can we create housing that makes it affordable for people who want to live in Gloucester. Um, we talked about getting people informed. Having community meetings, um, that is important. Breaking it down, 18 pages is a lot to read. How can we make that into smaller, easier ways for people to understand? Getting the message out, that's important. And that's what I'm running for, is to get the message out. Um, you know, we talk about you know, again, like the right to zone, not to build. Where can we spread it out from all the wars to um, help out the community? Are we already in compliance with a lot of things that are going to be happening? Um, that is why, you know, I'm looking at this and things are constantly changing through the state. I feel like every week there's a new proposal, a new something to work with. So it's just getting the information out and remembering it's the right to zone, not to build. Uh, I think that's the important thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, following the same order, each candidate has 30 seconds to respond, and we will start with Scott. Thank you. Uh, I don't really have a lot to add to what's already been said, but, I, excuse me, <laughs> you know, I, I too wonder if we couldn't do more around the West Gloucester Station rather than concentrating strictly on the downtown Ward 2 neighborhoods, but there, there will be development around uh, the downtown Gloucester Railroad Station. Um, we look at what's been proposed now um, for... Um, the rail, the rail track off the, behind behind Shaw's. And the Shaw's building itself has a new owner who's very likely gonna look at opportunities for, to develop that. So we need to have good guidelines in place that meet our needs, but also address this 3A zoning requirement. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Um, to Frank's point, um, we had ward forums back in March of 2022 that did not capture the feedback from the residents. Many spoke um, in, in each ward. Everyone talks about affordable housing and yet all around us are examples of buildings that veer away from that goal and sidestep the interconnected issues. I, I, I look around and what we're building in our city is, is far from affordable. Um, I'm looking at the commercial buildings that are going up on East Main Street. Thank commercial you, condos. I'm, I'm done. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs>
Dylan, you have 30 seconds. Thank you. What I really want to stress here is that we need, if we're going to be complying with this, how do we do it in a way that respects the unique character of our neighborhoods, the history of our community, and what further could there be changes from the state? And I also want to hear from the community and specifically people in this, in my ward, how it's going to affect them if the development's going to be happening in and around the MBTA um, on Railroad Ave. Thank you. Thank you. Dan, you have 30 seconds. Uh, I just want to say first, you know, I think it's important that we comply with this law, but I think it's important to think about the spirit of the law, which is generating more affordable housing rather than the letter. Uh, and I think that this law about changing zoning is not going to answer our needs for affordable housing. We, could, we should comply with it because we don't want to lose our grants, but we need to do a lot more in terms of the city actually promoting affordable housing that's genuinely affordable than just changing some zoning around. Thank you. Marjorie, you have 30 seconds. Thanks. You know, no one, no one knows at this point how this is all going to pan out, you know, as time goes forward. Um, yes, we have to comply, but, uh, you know, we need to rein it in a little bit. You cannot inundate Ward 2 and, and Ward 3 with massive amounts of, of building. You know, is that necessarily going to happen? Who knows? Nobody knows how this is going to go, you know, go forward. And communication is key. You know, understanding is key. Getting correct information is key. And, you know, um, and not, not using Facebook as your only means of learning something because the arguments that, that have ensued are just not going to change anything. It's not going to change anybody's opinion, and they're really ugly, and we thank are you, all Marjorie. so much better than that. Thank you, thank you. All right, Frank, you have 30 seconds. Yes, I think the most important thing is understanding the facts of what's going on. And like we all said, things are constantly changing through um, the state. So it's really just understanding, going with it, and we have to follow the law. And with the law, hopefully we'll be able to create housing for not just this generation, but future generations for Gloucester. Thank you. Thank you. All right, question number two. We will begin with Marianne. And the question is, Dogtown is an unspoiled 1,100 acres in the middle of Cape Ann that was deeded to Gloucester by the Babson family in 1931. Much discussion is occurring on ways to continue the preservation of Dogtown. It has been proposed that Gloucester sell off carbon credits in Dogtown for a one-time fee to a buyer who would use them to be excused from local environmental greenhouse emission restrictions. Carbon credits are permits that allow the buyer to emit carbon dioxide or other greenhouse gases elsewhere on the planet. The sale of carbon credits would then result in deed restrictions in Dogtown. The land would not be sold, just the carbon credits. What is your opinion on this issue? So Marianne, you begin and you have 90 seconds. As a longtime advocate for open space and open discussion, I absolutely believe that Dogtown is special and sh should be preserved. Arguments about preservation versus speculation come up. We have a 400 plus year history with it as is. The key word in the question is sell. Who is to say language of the sale of these carbon credits will not be amended or challenged in court one day and suddenly the land we once thought was protected has now been invaded upon and new deals are formed. We can't take that risk. We've learned all too well how protected land can be and has been removed. So many have been inspired to study it, write about it, bike it, hike it, and even paint it. Dogtown's rich history, abounding mysteries, landmarks, and public health benefits are so valuable and irreplaceable. Also, one more thing, and as a ward counselor, I'm ready for questions like this that illustrate the importance of clarification. Much discussion is occurring and it has been proposed where, among who, why, and who is missing. Thank you. Thank you. OK, Dylan, you have 90 Thank seconds. Thank you. Growing up in Gloucester, I remember walking through Dogtown as a kid and seeing that history, seeing the indigenous people's history, seeing the colonial American history, and as I walked as a young kid, I was like, why did settlers leave here? What, why? 
for the question at hand, I understand that it came up in a discussion at a planning board meeting, but it is not a proposal being considered. And from what I heard at a previous debate, that there's this is a non-starter. What I want to do is educate myself on the tools of what we can do to preserve our open spaces. And I know everyone in this room can agree that it, we need to open our, we need to preserve our open spaces. It's critical. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Dan, you're next. Well, I have to say, I think, you know, Dogtown is one of many great open spaces in Gloucester. Uh, my family, we usually go to Eagle Rock and hike up there in the Thompson Street Reservation. My, my daughter was asking just the other day if we could go there again. We haven't been there since the summer. Um, but with regard to carbon credits, I have to say, I think it sounds like a great idea. And actually, sort of for the opposite reason uh, that Marianne was saying, because you know, Gloucester has the benefit of a relatively good tax base, but Gloucester could fall on hard times, and there's always the temptation to sell off municipal land to fill coffers if times are hard. And actually, if we sold these carbon credit uh, restrictions, it would make this land much less attractive for buyers to buy one day and it would actually reduce the temptation in the future to sell off the land to some developer if, you know, God forbid, we had some terrible times and, and serious budgetary uh, difficulties. So I think, you know, environmental easements on lands are common all over the country, um, and I think, you know, there's no reason not to do it here if it can benefit uh, the, the carbon credit market and also make it less of a temptation to maybe someday sell off this land if, as I said, uh, we have budgetary problems here in Gloucester. Thank you. All right, let's see. Marjorie, you're next, 90 seconds. Um, I think that this is a slippery, slippery slope that best be avoided. Um, if Gloucester is serious about going green and being stewards of the environment, selling off a non-tangible commodity to a corporation so that they may increase their carbon footprint elsewhere and thus avoid accountability is a fool's errand. It's not helping the planet and the money is ill-gotten if it is facilitating bad practice and avoidance of regulations elsewhere. It doesn't lessen the problem of greenhouse gases, it just circumvents the accountabil accountability. You know, in theory it sounds great, but if you take the time to really understand it and see which industries and corporations benefit, you would likely think twice about even considering um, carbon credits. I, you know, Dogtown is, a, is, a, is an amazing place. It was my playground when I was a kid, you know, and I, I think you give an inch and someone will take a mile, always. Thank you. Frank, you're next. You have 90 seconds. Um, this, you know, talking to, listen to other debates, this is a non-starter um, issue. They're not going to do it, you know, nothing's going to be happening there. And as a war for a counselor, you know, hopefully, um, I take every issue very seriously, and especially this being, this is being Ward 4. Um, again, it's having meetings, listening to the folks, and making sure Dogtown is, and Dogtown stays the way it's supposed to be. And that's, we're not changing a single thing. We all, we've heard about, you know, fellow counselors here, um, how much we love Dogtown. And I bet if I went to every single person in Ward 4, they would love Dogtown as well. It's a great part of Gloucester, and I love walking Dogtown, and I just love taking my kids there. It means so much to me to keep it green. So, like Marjorie said, we don't want to give anything away. This is our land, and let's preserve it. Thank you. Mr. Scott, you're next. 90 seconds. I'm, I think I'm going to echo several of my com comrades here, but first and foremost, my family and I love Dogtown. Uh, my kids grew up exploring the history of Gloucester and Dogtown, climbing Whale's Jaw and Peter's Pulpit and finding the 24 Babs and WPA Boulder slogans, the foundation holes, figuring out where Granny's Day, Granny Day's swamp was, and finding the stone marking where James Mary was gored by the bull. My kids still talk about that, and that's 20 years, 30 years later. Most of all, most, all of Dogtown is safe in, un, in, a deeded, in deeded trusts, protected in perpetuity by Gloucester, by Rockport, by Greenbelt, by conservation restrictions. This is the fact already. The Babson watershed has been policed from polluters and camping vagrants for years by the likes of my friends Ted Tarr, Carolyn O'Connor, and Joe Orange. 
we may have local discussions about maintaining Dogtown's wild status versus providing better public access and amenities, and that's fine. I know that our composting center has outgrown its site next to the Sportsman's Club on Dogtown Road, and I wish that we could have some good controlled burns to thin the growth, bring back the views, and the blueberry harvest. And if I haven't spoken about the sale of carbon credits for Dogtown, the idea of selling the rights of our protections to Gloucester's, to Dogtown's solar, wind, tree, etc., to offset someone else's pollution, the reason I haven't mentioned it is because I don't know much about it, but I honestly don't think that there's likely a scenario that's going to happen or be pursued very time, anytime soon. It's a non-issue. Dogtown is already protected and preserved forever, and we don't need to complicate things that are good. Even for some theoretical carbon credits, it's not for sale. Scott, thank you. Okay, so now we are at the 30-second rebuttal, and Marianne, we'll begin with you. Well, I'd, I'd like to respond to Dan, and I would ask Dan, do we know um, if the purchase of, of these carbon credits would be perennial, where they could be sold over and over again, or would it be a one-time purchase that they can't use over and over again? And I, I really would like to say that I agree with everything that Scott said. We, we really need to protect this. Um, it, it's such an, in, a valuable piece of property. Um, that's been here since the beginning, and, and why wouldn't we want to keep it that way? Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Dylan, you have 30 seconds. I would reiterate what I said pr prior, and from my understanding, it's, it's a non-starter, but we need to preserve our open space. We need to preserve it. It's part of our history. Dogtown is part of the history of this country as well, because of, as I was saying, the colonial American history, the indigenous people's history, we need to preserve it, and this is a non-starter. And if it was proposed, I would not support it. Thank you. Proposal or what proposal this is, uh, but carbon credits are, I mean, I think it's really important to remember that carbon credits don't give anyone the right to develop or do anything on the land. And they're designed to reduce over the long term by, in every system of carbon credits, it's a market. And every year, companies have to comply with lower and lower carbon levels. And then it's designed with a market mechanism so that they can buy carbon credits uh, or sell carbon credits in a way that will reduce on uh, long-term pollution. So I think it usually is annual, but I haven't seen these details. Thank you, Dan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Frank Marjorie? is taking very good care of me tonight. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I like to see Dogtown um, left as Dogtown, you know, preserve it, protect it. Um, I like the idea of controlled burns to bring back the blueberry bushes because that was such a joy, you know, as, as a youth. <laughs> but thanks. Thank you. Scott, I think we all agree with you on this one. Um, you know, very well said. And like I said, you know, being the ward for a counselor, hopefully, on November 7th, um, it's preserving um, Dogtown and keeping Dogtown as is, as it's a special place for everyone in Gloucester, and I just want to keep it that way. Thank you. So let's see. Oh, hold on. I'm set. Scott? Uh, I would just, just follow up by saying that each of our neighborhoods throughout Gloucester is blessed with our, our own green space and uh, opportunities for us to get out and, and stretch and enjoy nature. Uh, in, in East Gloucester and Ward 1, um, we have Swinson's Field and the, the Pines. We have the Sane Fields. Uh, we have uh, all of our beaches and marshlands. In West Gloucester, we have Ravenswood. Uh, we have uh, other areas throughout town. It's not just Ravenswood, but we are truly blessed both on the interior and our landmass and on the sides of on the perimeter of us in the oceans by being able to Thank enjoy and appreciate nature. And that's a part of what makes it a joy to live here and makes thank it so you, attractive, attractive to, to buy here. <laughs> thank you, thank you. All right, question number three. So before we read the question, I do wanna take a moment. There's um, a little bit of noise in the audience and I just wanna say it's hard for me to actually hear some of the candidates. So what they're saying is really important. So I would like everyone to be a little respectful and um, keep conversations to a minimum. All right, so question three, we're going to start with Dylan. 
and it is. The recent amendment to the City Council Code of Conduct states councilors, when seeking services for constituents, may only access city staff exclusively through the mayor's office. What is your opinion on this policy? So Dylan, you have 90 seconds. Thank you. I wanna just add to my previous question very quickly and living in Ward 2, we have limited green space and we need to preserve that green space. It's very important. You think of Burnham's Field growing up on Green Street Park. My cousin's in the audience. She fought to update Green Street Park, make it to get the park cleaned up as a kid. We'll have to find that article. Um, as I, to the question at hand, as I understand it, this policy was agreed upon in 2022, but it's been a long-standing policy. Upon doing a quick Google search, it seems that many cities and towns across the country, select boards, city councils, have a code of conduct. I understand it can be frustrating for city councilors to try to deliver for their constituents. That's a real frustration. I would love to work collaboratively to deliver results for the ward, work with whoever the mayor may be, and I will try my darndest to deliver for my constituents in Ward 2. I will fight like hell for them. Thank you. Thank you. Daniel, you have 90 seconds. Well, so I want to start by saying that the idea of a code of conduct is very important, and I think the most important thing is to abide by that code of conduct. And if this is the code of conduct, when I'm on the city councilor, I'll certainly abide by it and go through the mayor's office. But I don't think it's a great idea to channel everything directly through the mayor's office. The mayor's very busy, and I've spoken to a lot of ward constituents who often feel like they have no voice, that they're calling some kind of faceless bureaucracy whenever they try and deal with city institutions. Uh, on the other hand, I also think it's really important for people who are especially at lower rungs of the bureaucracy to feel like they're not gonna be, uh, they're not gonna be hounded or persecuted by a city councilor who wants to kind of make a name for themselves by going after people. Um, I think it makes more sense that the heads of departments should be allowed to be contacted directly by city councilors as well as the mayor's office, but nobody below the level of a head of a department. Um, I don't think this is an enormous issue of trying to change the code of conduct from what it is now, but if I had my ideal code of conduct, it would allow city councilors to con uh, contact heads of departments to head of the public works department to say, hey, this is going on, there's this pothole here, rather than having to go all the way through the mayor's office. Thank you. Let's see, Marjorie, you're next. You have yeah, 90 I, seconds. I, provided that counselors conduct themselves in a respectful and professional manner, they should be able to seek information on behalf of their constituents. The ward counselors are the liaisons for the constituents, and in order to be effective, they must be trusted to do the right thing by the mayor's office, their fellow counselors, and the people that they have been elected to represent. I think the mayor's office should absolutely be kept apprised of actions taken, and pertinent communication should be forwarded so as to be part of the public record. You can't be a voice of the people if you can't use your voice. As long as no laws are broken, no conflicts of interest arise, and counselors act in good faith and with integrity, they should be allowed to communicate, communicate on behalf of the citizens that they represent. Thank you. Frank, you have 90 seconds. As the current Ward 3 counselor and um, voting on this in, you know, last year, I don't have an issue with this. Um, talking to the administration, you know, if you need a yes or no question, go ahead, contact the department head and get the answer you need for your constituent. If there's a more detailed or more problematic issue, yes, I think we, you know, contact the mayor's office, or request the mayor, and we, you know, copy the clerk's office and we are able to gain answers in a very short matter of time to be able to get back to our constituents. And, you know, being the counselor in Ward 3, if I feel like it's waiting too long to get an answer, you know, it's putting pressure on the administration, putting, the par uh, putting pressure to get an answer for my constituent. That's what we're here for. We're here to be the voice of the people. Um, and the code of co having a code of conduct is not a problem um, for me. And I've never had an issue being able to get an answer for anybody that needed an answer. Um, that's why I don't mind it, and I voted for this in um, 2022. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Scott, you have 90 seconds. Thank you. Uh, back in 2020, Councilors Val Gilman and John McCarthy attended a mass 
municipal association conference statewide in all the towns and communities where codes of conduct were discussed and recommended and our prior council adopted our own current code and the current council in, in place now again unanimously endorsed it early in our early in our term and our code of conduct for city council includes quote councillors shall work with a chain of command specifically through the mayor and the chief administrative officer to enlist the support and the skills of city staff in addressing the needs of the community, end quote. The city's biggest budget expense is our municipal staff. If counselors abuse our staff's time, they can't do their jobs. Department heads and staff report to the mayor, not to the mayor and nine other counselors. That's too many bosses for anybody to cope with. After eight years on the budget and finance committee of, of the council, uh, for as chair, I know all of our department, city, city department heads. I know their budgets and I know their priorities and I have no problem reaching out to them, as Frank just mentioned, with short, specific questions for city staff. But I'm very mindful of distracting city staff from getting their work done. Requests going to, through the mayor's office and Pam Toby, Greg's constituent services person, always works well. It's a system just like using our constituent C-click fix tool online for efficiently reporting issues to the DPW. It works well, and it's important to follow the clear guidelines for a relationship between all city staff and the mayor's office and the council. It builds mutual respect. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> Marianne, you have 90 seconds. Thank you. No question, counselors should abide by ethics and conduct codes. I have no problem understanding the intention behind any code of conduct. Seems to me that the trouble has come in the past when some counselors have had access to information while others may not have. Constituents are not asking for more speed bumps, but instead seeking information from their elected representatives. And one of the reasons why I'm running for a seat is to be able to gather and provide that necessary information that the constituents seek. Building relationships is critical between the council, administration, and constituents. And, and I, I would like to say that it's been troublesome to watch some of our meetings um, where I feel, having attended many, many meetings over the last several years, that our counselors are not getting the information that they've requi or requested um, for many, many weeks. And, and that's hard to watch. And I hope that um, something can change. I don't know what, but I just hope something can change to bring, bring an end to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so Dylan, you have 30 seconds to respond. Okay. Thank you. What I, what I will additionally say is I hope to have a good working relationship with whoever the mayor may be, have a good working relationship with the constituent services director and all department heads, getting to know them on a first name basis. And beyond that, I think it's important to follow a code of conduct and follow those procedures, but it, again, it can be frustrating sometimes for counselors when constituents are calling and an answer is, hasn't been met right away. It can, be, it can be a real frustration. Thank you. Daniel, you have 30 seconds. Well, I just wanna say, you know, I think the idea of a code of conduct in general is so important because Abiding by a code is one of the basic things that makes us a society rather than a bunch of wild people. And I feel like making sure we have order amongst the counselors and how they treat each other and how they treat the city staff and having order in our city too. Sometimes people don't treat each other very well, for example, on Facebook. And I think all of us thinking more about our conduct and abiding by you know, maybe just traditional codes of etiquette would really help us, and I think that having a code of conduct for the city council is an important aspect of that. Thank you very much. Marjorie? Yeah, you know, I think everybody needs to hold themselves to the absolute highest standards. Um, you know, uh, a code of, the, the code of ethics is absolutely important in, you know, as a guideline, but if you cannot foster communication, you will not foster trust. 
Thank you. Frank, you have 30 seconds. Like I said earlier, I have no problem with the code of conduct. It's something that I voted on last year. Um, I've already started building relationships with um, the department heads and the administration, which, which I think is very important. And again, communication to the constituents who are asking for these answers is being able to communicate them and let them know that you know, it's taking a little bit longer or putting pressure on the, the particular department to get the answer for the constituent. And conducting yourself in a code of conduct and professionally is what we should be doing at all times. Thank you. Thank you. Scott, you have 30 seconds. Thank you. Uh, I don't really have much to add beyond what we've all said. I think we're in general agreement. We're also in agreement, agreement that City Hall can be intimidating and it can be sometimes frustrating and it's the role of, of city councilors, particularly I think of ward, ward councilors representing a, a, a regional district in town like Ward 1 where I represent, helping provide them access to City Hall in a way that takes away some of that intimidation and helps people get their, their questions answered. Thank you very much. All right. All right, so that was the end of question three. We're on to question four. And, oh, I'm so sorry. I am very, very sorry. You have 30 seconds. I, I would just like to say that councilors that are elected, they take an oath on those codes. And, um, but we also have an obligation to the constituents and the obligation to the constituents are to get the answers that they request and to bring forth proposals um, and see to it that, th that those move forward. And if we can't have uh, the conversation higher up the chain and get those answers back, then, then we do, again, have a, have a problem. So Thank I'd, like you. To see, I'd like to see that we can work that out. Thank you. Now we will move on to question four. All right, so question four, we will begin with Dan. And the question is, for, for, for 400 years, Gloucester has benefited from a high standard of living from the wages derived from its waterfront seafood industry and the relating supporting industries. New proposals are being floated to change the waterfront to a more residential, restaurants, and even a theater use. What is your vision to promote the best future for our seaport, and how would you attract new manufacturing and other industries that provide full-time, year-round, living wage employment, which would advance the city's economic stability? So Dan, we're gonna begin with you, and you have 90 seconds. A lot wrapped up in this question. Uh, I wanna talk first about um, well, about the waterfront and the fishing industry. I mean, it makes Gloucester what it is. There's a, it's a great picture of me from when I was a baby in front of the fisherman statue when my parents took me there. And, um, you know, and this is one of the important reasons why my family wanted to live in Gloucester. Um, my wife is a now um, uh, part-time uh, uh, amateur shellfisher woman. I know my, uh, my com opponent's uh, father, I think, is a shellfisherman. And um, you know, this is an important part of Gloucester is, is our fishing heritage. Um, and my neighbor who lives across the street who works for Sector 3, he used, to be, uh, he used to be a fisherman himself. You know, I spent a lot of time talking with him about the waterfront because my other neighbor next door has a pleasure craft and he's really interested in kind of, you know, more restaurants and things like that on the waterfront. Um, and I think it's really important to think about the parts of the waterfront that are not being used as well as they could, either for fishing or for some of these more entertainment-oriented things. I don't think we need a big theater down there. If anything, we maybe need more parking close to downtown. But I also think there's a lot of parts of the waterfront where the fishing industry could do better if there was investment from the city from outside sources in, in docks and wharfage. And I think that's something that we could look at as a public investment to help keep our fishing industry as healthy as it can be. Thank you very much. Let's see, Marjorie, you have 90 seconds. Yeah, um, we owe it to the 10,000 souls lost at sea to preserve their legacy and to protect the waterfront from becoming a members only club. 
Once gone, it's gone forever. Um, regarding proposals, no one can arbitrarily change the marine industrial zoning. Any change in zoning um, would require the coastal zone management approval, and they are very committed to protecting designated ports. Um, the proposed idea for a theater on Roger Street is not something that I would support. You know, I think we owe it to posterity to preserve that iconic view. Uh, we already have a performance venue set to open right across the street from there, and we have world-class theater alive and well just a few miles down the road. Um, and, and quite frankly, we have so many creatives that live in this community, we don't have the need to import talent. Um, you know, regarding attracting new industry, you know, I'm not qualified to expound upon that right now, and I need a whole lot of education in that area. Um, you know, if I get elected, I hopefully, and I'm sure my um, possible future colleagues would assist me in that, you know, and I'd rather give you an honest, I, I don't know the answer to that, than muddle my way through a, you know, an insincere response. Thanks. Thank you. Frank? Yeah, there is a lot into this question. And, um, you know, being a son of a fisherman, I think it's important to protect the fishing industry. Um, we have many people who come here to see the fisherman statue and look at the names um, who are lost at sea. Um, but finding creative ways to help Gloucester and moving Gloucester forward is important. And working with the neighborhoods and working with the business owners, how can we create something in that waterfront in the areas that are not being used? Um, I think that's important as well. Um, it's a beautiful area. It's, you know, people come to Gloucester to live on the coast. Um, you know, I met my wife about nine years ago, and I t she lives in the middle of the country, and I told her I'm not moving there because I need to live by the ocean. Um, that's important to me. So anything we c I can do to preserve the ocean and protect Gloucester's waterfront is important to me. Thank you. Thank you. Scott, you have 90 seconds. I don't know anything about Gloucester's waterfront. <laughs> <laughs> Having only worked at Cape Pond Ice Company since 1983, and with a 40-year experience of being and working on Gloucester Harbor and serving the Gloucester fishing fleet, I know how sharply and sadly the, the ground fish industry has tanked, coping with toughening, toughening federal regulations, Unexplained sinkings to, for insurance purposes, the 1990 boat bait buyback program that decimated our most productive fishers. During my time, Cape Pond Ice Company's ice sales declined 90%, 90% from 40,000 tons a year to this year under 4,000 tons. 90% down in spite of all our efforts, all our creative efforts. We've downsized and we've shrunk and we were finally foreclosed on by our bank and for, forced to sell. My son and I keep our ice service going today as tenants from a tiny corner of the plant for the handful of fishing vessels that are still left that depend upon us. Warming oceans, overfishing government regulation, all have combined to force a dramatic contraction of our core fleet, which is now just a shadow of what it was. And we still have significant stagnant vacant harbor property, including I-4C2 and then 112 Commercial Street where the old producer's fish company was. Our harbor economy has always been diversified over the decades and hundreds of years between fishing industry, science and entertainment, recreation and tourism. Right now, Gloucester Harbor begs reinvestment and revitalization as our last neglected and underutilized industrial park. Use of all harbor properties is still very you, tightly Scott. restricted by our MI Marine Thank Industrial you. Zoning. Thank, Thank you. you. Marianne. Thank you. When I think of Gloucester, I refer to it as a fishing port, rich in history, rich in heritage, and a port that has sustained itself for 400 plus years. Take a moment to think about that. While change is inevitable, I am concerned that we will lose the rich history if we change the use from marine industrial to, let's say, residential. Our working waterfront is filled with a positive mix of industrial, commercial, and recreational boating, and complementary businesses, arts and cultural offerings, and so much more. I wouldn't describe the broad range as anything new, despite changes over time. The mix is what ensures economic sta uh, stability. We should maintain that balance. While we must pursue opportunities at office, we also need to continue to protect and preserve what makes Gloucester so unique. 
That takes thoughtful planning. How do we bring in other industries? What separates Gloucester from other cities and towns whose access is much easier to, to get to? A welcoming community, great schools, infrastructure that can support such a business. Thank you. Dylan, you have 90 seconds. Thank you. You mentioned at the beginning of the question 400 years. We're celebrating 400 years this year. 400 years of Gloucester. So many have contributed to that history, including my own family. Captain John Lane, who helped protect Gloucester from the British all the way up to my father, working as a lobsterman, as my worthy opponent said, as a clam digger currently. He's been doing that for 20 plus years, and 68, still doing it. I think about that history, and I know so many in this room and across this city have contributed to that history. Their families have contributed to Gloucester's history. We're the oldest working seaport in America. The fishing industry has seen changes. Right now, we are the largest lobster port, number one lobster port in Massachusetts. That's something we should celebrate. And we have to balance the needs of the fishing industry, tourism, small business economy, and also adequate parking. That's a critical piece of the puzzle here. Uh, engaging the neighborhood, we're talking about the comprehensive planning initiative. How do we bring the community along when we talk about these issues? Also, no matter what is proposed at the I4C2 lot, and there's two lots there, the lot that's where lobster men store their, their traps, et cetera, that's protected. The other area would be where the proposal goes, that proposal or any proposal. And that, has to have, that conversation has to be a community conversation, and it also has to include the lobster men and women. There's some women down there. Uh, and the, as I said, the fishing and lo lobstering, tourism, they're all intertwined. And I will finally oh. say, growth for growth's sake is not a smart way to build for our future. All Thank right, you. Dylan. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So we are on to the 30-second response. Dan, you have 30 seconds. Yeah, I just want to uh, reiterate what uh, Dylan was saying about parking, which is a huge issue downtown. I've heard from lots of constituents that this is needed. Uh, and the other thing I want to say is, you know, we think about restaurants, and you know, sometimes it seems like, oh, this is kind of a members-only club. But there's a lot of people from Gloucester who are employed there. I, I worked as a bartender at one of the restaurants down there, and a lot of Gloucester community members work at these restaurants, and I think that they're also one of the things that keeps people coming to Gloucester and keeps it to be a cut above some of the other seaports in, in Massachusetts and in our area. Thank you. Yeah, you know, um, I think, you know, just, I'm just going to close it out by saying you need to protect the waterfront. you got to be very, very careful. Um, you know, once it's gone, it's gone forever, and there's no taking it back. So whatever happens in the future with, with the, uh, you know, existing spaces that are still open, be very, very careful, you know, where you, where you head down that road. Frank. I think everyone in this room um, and people who live in Gloucester love Gloucester for this waterfront and the, um, the views that it has. And anything we do to protect it is what we're going to do. And that's why we live in this beautiful community. We all want to, you know, we either were born here or you moved here. It doesn't matter. You're a Gloucester resident. And um, you're here because you love it. Thank you. Thank you. Scott. I get to finish my uh, interruption there. <laughs> Taking too long. I was saying just a moment ago that the use of all harbor properties in Gloucester on Gloucester Harbor is very tightly restricted by our marine industrial industrial zoning locally and at the state level by the Massachusetts designated port area restrictions, which provide for no housing, no new marinas, no restaurants, unless they're already grandfathered. And in spite of all our well-intentioned protections, we've lost a lot of grit, a lot of jobs, and Gloucester's working waterfront is slowly, sadly, slipping away from us. Mary. I think I'm okay with the with the answers that I gave, and I think I'll let it still take. All right. And I just will go to the original question that you mentioned about the proposal for the theater. 
I don't feel that works for I4C2, and I will not support it. The rendering, it doesn't work for that location, from my understanding. And I will just add that people come to Gloucester because we are the oldest seaport in America, people from all over the world. I was in England a few months ago, and people were like, oh, you're from Gloucester. I saw the movies, and they, they like, you can't wait to see it. That's the, we need to celebrate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am going to um, rely on CPAC. Last question or pause? Seven fifteen. Let's go for it. Okay. So we're gonna do one more question, and we will begin with Marjorie. So question number five is: The city presently has forty-two boards and commissions, with approximately two hundred and fifty-five non-elected mayoral appointed members. Some of these boards and commissions are advisory; others have regulatory power, which affect the city and impacts our citizens. Volunteer board and commission members are not required to provide contact information, which impedes public access to information via email and other means. Public engagement at each board meeting is at the discretion of the chair, making it difficult for citizens to follow all of these meetings effectively. What steps would you take to enable citizens to participate at all board and commission meetings and what steps would you take to introduce accountability to the citizens of Gloucesters from these boards and commissions? Again, Marjorie, we're going to start with you, and you have 90 seconds. You know, um, I, first of all, I commend each and every person who graciously, graciously volunteers their time and knowledge. You know, they put themselves out there where, the, where others will not, and that's definitely not an easy road to travel. You know, on the surface of it, it seems somewhat convoluted. You know, what are the oversights involved with these appointments and how are conflicts of interest avoided? You know, that being said, communication is key and to tr transparency and public, if, as public participation is discretionary, there has to be some avenue of communication. You know, citizens should be able to reach out with concerns and questions and when transparency exists, so does trust. Thank you. Frank? Well, thank you, Simon. <laughs> I didn't say that. Was, that was her watch. Um, being on the Ordinance and Administration um, Committee, um, that is awesome. Um, what I see every other week is people want to join boards. And what I see is a community that wants to help Gloucester. Um, and it's whether people have lived in Gloucester for one year or 30 years. They moved here, and they want to be a part of a board and they want to help. Um, so it's great seeing that in and getting to know the people um, of this great community. Um, you know, before I was a city councilor, I was on the Tourist Commission, and then COVID happened, and that sort of changed things there. Um, but I remember sitting in the mayor's office, wanting to be part of the Tourist Commission, and he asked me what I wanted to do. And I said, I just want to be able to help the community and learn more about local politics. And I think that was great to me, and I was able to you know, sit in front of the city council not knowing a single person and become a member of the Tourist Commission. Um, that was awesome. And then being a part of the meetings, I, we think we had three and then COVID happened and things really changed everything for not just myself and everyone. Um, but, you know, working with the city and creating potential emails for like planningboard.org or waterwaysboard.org and just being able to communicate with people Posting things on you know the city websites or you know a council website, that's a great way to be able to get people more um, active and understanding what goes on in these boards. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Scott, you have 90 seconds. Thank you. Uh, and to begin again, thank you to all of our community's volunteers. They really do make the city work. And if you'd like to apply and uh, try and uh, find a board for you, Please contact the mayor's office, Melissa Gillis, or uh, um, anybody in his office. And uh, I'm trying to think of uh, Pam Toby is the other person to see what o what openings exist and if you can come. And then the mayor will interview you, and then the city council, and then you go to the city council for approval. But I agree with this concern about access to the public, and I don't think it's intentional. But I suspect that the change relates to updated issues about privacy and protecting our citizen volunteers from undue harassment. And I'm sure it can be frustrating when you're trying to reach them. 
In most cases, our, our boards and commissions are advisory and they don't have regulatory powers. It used to be easier to find contact phone numbers and emails for the volunteer members of our 42 odd boards and commissions, ZBA, Planning Board, Board of Health, Conservation Commission, to the Traffic Commission, the Fisheries Commission, the Stage Fort Park Advisory Group. But for those who have um, boards and commissions who, have work, who are working within the city department, one can reach them through city staff. For the others, you really have to reach out through Pam Toby or Melissa Gillis in the, in the mayor's office. And I also have made a risk request to Mayor Borga to consider providing city of Gloucester emails, city of Gloucester emails to these boards and commission members to improve our easy access to them. And if it works through our IT department and otherwise, this would certainly be a help in terms of being able to access these individuals without infringing on their privacy. Thanks. Thank you. Marianne. Okay, this is a great question. I do agree that the information should be as public and easy to find, but the reality is it's not that simple. I can say that firsthand because as familiar as I am with the city website, there have been plenty of times when information is unavailable. I've searched for minutes for a particular board only to find that the minutes haven't been updated. In fact, today, I searched the list on one board in particular that meets at least once a month, and they have not updated their minutes since February 2020. That's an issue that needs to be remedied, especially when a board is so active and is bringing critical information to the council for review and ultimately a vote. Wouldn't it be great to have important upcoming meetings linked to the traveling mobile sign? It's quite effective in our neighboring town of Essex and possibly a section of the newspaper that gives the weekly calendar of such meetings. These would be especially helpful to those who don't have the internet ac or don't have internet access and would draw more interest in city government. Even text by, by committee would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Dylan, you have 90 seconds. First off, I want to thank all of our volunteers for boards and commissions. Thank you. The dedication of our volunteers allows the community to look as beautiful as it does and allows the city to run effectively. While the authority to run boards and commissions and the rules they abide by are not in the purview of the city council, the council does have the ability to approve or deny candidates to the appointee to the appointment that they've been um, appointed by. Uh, good governance requires public participation. I will do my best in my position to let folks know about what's going on in our community and opportunities to participate. And a point of contact could possibly be the staff or the support, support person that works with that board, and board or commission. That's, my, that's kind of my idea about it. Thank you. Dan, you have 90 seconds. Yeah, I wanted to, uh, I liked what, what Scott had to say and you know, he mentioned the idea of protecting citizen volunteers uh, from harassment. And, um, you know, I can see how that can be, uh, be a concern. You know, I myself served on the board of registrars, uh, and I was subject to some nasty things said about me and posted about me in Facebook groups. Um, and it was unpleasant. Uh, now, I really didn't mind because, you know, I have a thick skin, but I can't imagine that there are a lot of people on some boards and volunteer, volunteers for boards who might want a little more privacy and still feel like they can contribute without maybe necessarily being dragged through uh, some kind of harassment uh, uh, gauntlet. Um, I really like Scott's idea of, uh, of making sure that all these people have City of Gloucester email addresses. Um, and it seems like, you know, what Marianne was saying, you know, these board minutes not being updated for years, perhaps this is an issue that there needs to be more resources for, for example, the city clerk's office, really to make sure that the websites are updated, and also maybe to make sure that the city website gets a kind of an entire overhaul, because it is very difficult to find your way around. We could do some, we could, uh, put some resources towards that, and that's something I would be in favor of if I were elected to city council. All right, thank you. Um, 
all of the people that are on all these different boards and commissions, and, and it's you know 100% volunteer. They clearly care about this city. Sorry, <laughs> um, all of the people that are on the boards and commissions clearly care about this city, and I I think um, you know the idea of LV, um, a, the city of Gloucester web or email would be fabulous because people really do need to have a way to communicate, to ask questions. If they don't feel like they're being valued, that's when when the anger and the the frustration boils over and that's happening so much in this city today thank you very much Frank you have 30 seconds yep um, it's some you know some very important to have these volunteers um, they do help move Gloucester forward um, and like Scott said it's creating emails for potentially maybe the board the chairperson to be able to have that email so people can contact that board directly and remember these people volunteer because they love Gloucester <laughs> and it's respecting them as anyone else that works for the city thank you Scott? I'd just like to say that I think this is a great question and I thank you all for bringing it up and I, it's, it's nice to think that there's something that we can improve upon as a city and as councillors and working with the administration and this is a good example of, of doing that and facilitating the role of volunteer public and access to them and it just makes the whole community work better together. Right. Thank you. Marianne? Yes, I too would like to thank all of the volunteers. In the past, I've seen many of these boards with empty seats, and I would like to consider condensing some of these boards. And, and, I, and I'd also like to limit the amount of appointments in which a person can participate in, because I have seen, there's been concerns of overlapping conflicts of interest, and I think that becomes a problem. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Dylan? What I will say uh, is that I think it's very important to have as much participation from the public as possible in the goings on of the community. I think a point, a point of contact, an email, like as, as Frank just said, uh, maybe for the chairperson of, the, of that board, or if there's a support staff. I work in another municipality. I've seen that where the support staff is that point of contact for the community. And I also encourage folks to join boards and commissions. That's really important so you can be part of the process. You can be part of your city and you can make positive change that you'd like to see. Thank you. Dan? Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with what uh, with all, all of my colleagues have, have said here. Uh, one thing that I will say is that as a, as a parent, somebody who has a full-time job and my wife works too, you know, it can be a challenge for parents, especially of young kids, to feel like they have the resources of time to participate as much in, in city business as, uh, as somebody who maybe doesn't have kids or is a retiree or something like that. And anything that can make that easier, whether it's time limitations on meetings uh, or anything like that, I think that would be, that would be beneficial. Thank you very much. All right. Well, that concludes the five questions that we have prepared for you. Thank you very much. Your questions and answers were great. We're going to take a brief pause, uh, maybe five, ten minutes, stretch your legs, and then we're going to come back and have a QA for the remainder of the hour. Okay, so we'll see you back in maximum 10 minutes. Five minutes, five minutes. Stretch, quick stretch. All right, there we go. Microphones are working. Woohoo! All right, we are going to start with the audience Q&A. Kelly has the microphone. Oh, thank you, Bud's gonna help. All righty, so the questions should be general questions, not aimed or directed at any one candidate. We are going to start with Frank. He will be the first one to answer. Do we have any audience questions? It's not working. It's not working. All right, who has a question? Everybody's happy. There's a question. It's a quiet crowd, and then someone stood up. Is it working? 
It's not working. It is working. It is, okay. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Okay, we're talking about the TOD, right? Everyone's talking about the TOD. I'd like to know what you think about the 40B units that are going in or behind McDonald's. I'm wondering what you think about the fact that they're studios, most of them, and also about the fact that there was two different grants written for this project, and both grants have two different titles on them and two different amounts for the apartments. One has 30 and one has 36. CPA has 30 and the other one has 36. So I'm wondering what you think about that because if we're gonna be supposed to be doing multi-families and right at the train station, that's like a fit right there at the train station. So we should think about that and have them not, you know, they should be multi-family and not single studios. Thank you. So we're going to start with Frank, and you have 60 seconds to answer that question. Well, thank, thank you for the question. And uh, Patty, you are definitely um, involved. Um, I, we see you on every meeting. Um, so and, you know, it's great to have people come out um, to the meetings. And you are definitely involved in the city, and you do pay attention. Um, so thank you for that. Um, it's, you know, it's important to you know, that we're creating housing. And let's work together to try to create more multifamily housing. I think that's important. And, um, I think that's most important, is try to create more housing for people that be able to live in this town. Thank you. Thank you. Scott? Sure. Thank you again, Patty. Um, of Myrtle Square and the Emerald, Green Emerald. The Emerald Forest. Emerald Forest, yeah. You know, the, the space that we're talking about here is, is the, I, I was trying to think of what was called before, that it's the, uh, the old railroad spur that used to be for Americold. It's behind the station and, and, and behind McDonald's. And it's a funny, long, Triangle. narrow space. And they, 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 pro they proposed a really unesthetic looking two-story two building there with a mix of two and three family and single studio apartments. And they have requested CPA support, which typically for a dis discounted affordable housing is not uncommon. We've partnered with Action or with, um, what's the name of the other one? Um, uh, mm -hmm. Har Harbor Light Partners for the projects like Cameron's project, like Haven Terrace. You know, all, all, these are all, they, re they require subsidization to create a, an incentive to build it. We def des definitely, desperately need to help subsidize and work with a nonprofit partner for a, a discounted affordable housing for seniors here in Gloucester, which we still lack. It was originally promised to be up at the industrial park. Yes. Sorry. Sure. You're over. Marianne. So, I am concerned of what Patty just said. There's two different grants, um, and, and it seems to have two different names attached to it, one with 36 units and one with 30. Um, while we need to create more housing, I want to go back to what I said at a, a couple of questions before, um, meeting around the table or meeting at the round table. I think that we need to take more time to include the people of that district and let them know, uh, have ward meetings with Ward 2 um, and even Ward 3 and, and ask them, ask those residents um, about it. I, I agree with Scott. Um, I saw the, the design for that development and it lacks the trees and, 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 and what gives a, a more of a community feel. It, it feels very sterile to me. And um, Thank you. I am concerned about traffic as well. <laughs> Thank you. Dylan, you have one minute. Thank you. And, and Patty, thank you for your question. And first off, I would like to reread the proposal to fully understand what has been proposed. Um, I haven't been able to do that yet. But anything that goes on, be it here or anywhere else, how does it fit the character of the neighborhood? How does it, how does, what kind of green space is involved in this development? That type of stuff I really want to look at. But I would like to reread the proposal before I make 
uh, decision on any of the questions you have, and I look forward to learning from you as well as we've talked beforehand. So thank you for your question, and thank you for everything that you do for our community. Thank you. Dan? Well, so I remember reading in that, about this in the paper, and I was quite <laughs> frustrated with the housing mix. Uh, you know, I think it's the vast majority. It's something like 80 or 85 percent of the apartments are these studios. And the idea this is workforce housing. I was sort of insulted by that because I feel like, well, I'm part of the workforce, but, you know, I can't have my wife and my daughter and I all in it. We're not like a bunch of drones that just have to be in a single uh, studio and then going to work and coming back. So that really bothered me. And I have to say, I think we have to do more to make sure that when we do have apartment projects, which I think are important, you know, I've lived in apartments lots of times in my life, both married and single, uh, and with a, a small child. And But I think we need more than just these one bedroom, the Halyard, they have a max of two bedroom apartments. You know, we need to make sure that we have some places where families can live and send their kids to school, you know, not make them move away to Haverhill like my daughter's friend did last year. Thank you. Um, first of all, I appreciate your passion. Thank you. Um, you know, that, that area back there is, is a bit of a swamp. Um, could definitely use a little bit of sprucing up. The rendition that I saw of the um, proposed or the, you know, the apartments that are going to be built there, it looks like a motel. Uh, you know, a bunch of studio apartments, it, it puts a tiny little scratch in the housing problem. It doesn't, it doesn't do much. And I think that it needs to be, you know, thought out to be more attractive, to be more functional, to if, it's, if you're going to put housing there to help people, a studio apartment is going to help one person. It's not going to help a family. Thank you. Frank? No, I think I, I agree with what everyone said is, you know, these studios, we need to help work in getting more, um, you know, family housing. Um, that's very important as, you know, it's just you moving Gloucester forward. People are trying to raise a family here, and we don't want to lose people to other um, cities and towns. Let's keep them in Gloucester. Do you want to do that? Oh, do you want to do that? If we if we continue with the twenty second rebuttal, we'll wrap, we won't have as much time. I uh, so I'm just going to speak. You know, wild here. I think we talked about that we didn't really need that after the mayoral one. So I guess, uh, I don't know if you were told that. For the mayoral, we gave people 20 second rebuttal. I don't think we really need it. I'm just gonna make an executive decision at this point. Um, so I think we just go on and ask another question. So. Hello? <laughs> Hello? I might not even Oh, for the television? Okay. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to thank all the candidates for showing up this evening. We couldn't have done this for the KPM Political Action Committee. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> so thank you for that, showing up and making this all possible. Uh, I have one question and I have a comment. And my, one, my question is, somebody, and I think it was Mr. Epstein mentioned a grant for the MBTA project? No. I jotted it down. That's why I'm asking the question, to find out what you, what you meant by it. Okay. Municipalities do not comply, they will may not be eligible for grant money. So I think that's where maybe, I'm not sure if it was Mr. Epstein, but that is part of the law. For grants if we don't, uh, if we don't accept this. Uh, so what, what's the, uh, the grant for, just to study? There's three buckets of money that the state, that the law, I don't, I don't know if I'm overstepping here. Yeah, but the, the law states that if you do not comply with the law, there's three buckets of grant money that you would not be eligible for. Oh. Part of the stick. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to stop right here and we're going to rephrase and start maybe 30 seconds. How about that? I just asked the question, but apparently we're not clear on what we're talking about. Is that true? 
grant money? Yeah, what is the grant money? What is it for? How much is it? Who's it who is it coming from? Who gets to control it? Okay, thank uh, you. So I, have, I have a comment. Oh. <laughs> um, I think when you start thinking about the MBTA project, it's, it's a bigger project than we all realize. It has many facets to it. Um, and I think one of the things we should really look at before we decide what to do with this is the infrastructure is going to eat us alive. You're going to have new sewer lines, new water lines, new electrical lines. You're going to have to beef up your police department, your fire department, more teachers for the kids in school. We might even have to build a new school. Okay, so that is one minute comment question. Okay. Thank you. All right, so I think we need to summarize. There's a question in there about grants and infrastructure. And Scott, we're gonna start with you for a one minute answer. Those thoughts. This, the, the carrot and sticks have fluctuated a little bit as, as the city and other municipalities have negotiated with the state about these criteria and guidelines, but they've, they've increased the number of eligible grant, what's that? They, they have increased the number of eligible grant programs that we would lose access to, including support that, the, uh, that our action people, it's sort of ironic that the people in town that support low income housing would be hit by the state's penalties if we don't comply with the 3A reg regulations. There are others such as the road and infrastructure grants that rebuilt Commercial Street for the new hotel and that rebuilt um, Portage Hill around the, uh, the uh, YMCA development project, Trask Street, that whole neighborhood. We got in the, in the neighborhood of five to ten million dollars of road infrastructure work it falls into a particular bucket. But those are, those are at risk. Thank you. Marianne? Buddy, I think that's a great question. Um, they speak of the grants, but I want to know how many grants, what's the total of the grants, what we will, you know, what will we lose if we don't comply? I'm concerned about the MBTA and its, its um, status right now. Um, it's not reliable. Um, I feel like we are being um, punished. I feel like we're, um, I feel like we, we really have to look into this much deeper depth. And before we have those answers, um, I don't know how we can move forward. I think it's a, I think it's going to take a long time to get those answers and, and I want to see them on the table. Um, Thank you. Um, I just want to go back quickly to Patty's question and what I think we also need to include is those neighborhood meetings, what you were saying with Ward 2 and Ward 3 and having even just neighborhood meetings outside on the street and just having a discussion. We need to bring the neighborhoods along and they need to be part of the process when whatever development happens, they need to be part of that process. Um, from my understanding to this question, it's 16 grants that communities could lose. That's my understanding. I would like us to really have further conversations in the community, ward meetings, so we can actually be, if we, we're going to comply with this, how do we get be creative with the zoning? And how do we do it in a way where the neighborhoods and the people in our community are contributing to this process and being a part of this process all along? It's very important, and that's what I think is been a little bit of a missing piece from my understanding. Thank you, Dylan. Dan? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so I guess you've heard the, the, the number of grants. The grants are from the state of Massachusetts government as far as I understand. Um, but, uh, you know, I think one thing that you really, you were talking about that is the idea of infrastructure. That Gloucester is a wonderful city and it's a beautiful place, but there's a lot of places, especially around Ward 2, where the infrastructure is worn out. 
where we have not been devoting resources and funds to keeping everything up to snuff. We know the story of the sewage treatment plant, but we've needed for 20 years and it's been kicked down the road. And I think it's really important as a city councilor to focus on making sure that we restore our infrastructure, that we maintain it, we don't just let things deteriorate. And indeed, many of the grants that we might lose out on are grants that will help us keep our infrastructure restored. So in some ways, it may be a catch-22, that if there's more people moving to Gloucester, although we don't have many more people now than we had decades ago, um, we, may have, uh, we may have a need for better infrastructure, but we already have that need, and we need to have resources to, to keep our infrastructure maintained. Thank you, Dan. Marjorie, you have one minute. Um, you know, I think that there's so much confusion and so much um, angst and anger about the, the whole MBTA mandate, and there is so much information that is going on, um, you know, on social media, uh, on the city website, you know, people talking in the coffee shop or whatever, and, and people are so angry, and I think the only way to move forward with this is to people need to be... It, we, people need to feel like they have some control about what's going on down there, and I think that most people feel like we have no control. You know, perception is reality. Thank you. Frank? I think one thing, we, one point thing to understand, it, it's a mandate. It's a law. We have, to, we have to go with it. And it's working with the state and the city officials to work together to help with the zoning. And you know, we don't want to lose any grant money. Um, it's very important to have this money to help Gloucester residents, not just for today, but for the future. And having the community, I think communication is a big thing, is having those community meetings, which I've done as a Ward 3 counselor, getting together with the neighbors, getting them the facts of what is going on, um, that is very important. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Tracy. My first question is, how many questions can I ask? So I have here in my hand, Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 40A, Subsection 3A, and it uh, shall be known as the Zoning Law. And it states, on paragraph B, a an MBTA community that fails to comply with this section shall not be eligible for funds from one, the Housing Choice Initiative, which I checked with the city auditor and we received zero money from them. So we're gonna lose zero money that we never had. The second one, it goes on to say, um, number two, the second one is the Local Capital Projects Fund, which we received zero money from. Number three is the Mass Works Infrastructure Program, which we received three million dollars from to repair the damage that they did to the Trask Street neighborhood to um, run cables and sewer or whatever they had to do to build the halyard. So if we never built the halyard, we never would have needed the three million. My question is, I also have on my phone Hold on, sorry. Um. Over time, Tracy. Oh, no. Come on. So the question. <laughs> so what grants are we going to lose? All right. So the question is, what grants are we going to lose? And we are starting with Marianne on this one. To be honest. I don't know. I don't know because it has never been spoken at any meetings that I know of. Um, they just keep saying that we're going to lose multiple grants. And I, that's why I asked. Did you, did you have a clarification on that? Right. Right. So, so can she reread that? I mean, I'm now. Do you want to rephrase your question, Tracy? Yes. Um, so 
the law states that we're going to lose those three grants, or we may lose those three grants. The first two we got zero, and the, sec the third one we got three million. The guidelines name 13 grants that say determination of compliance in paragraph nine. How do you explain that? How do you exp explain that the Massachusetts general law on mass.gov says three grants, and then the um, guidelines say 13. How, is, how are we supposed to compute? How does that make sense? I do, wh well, what is your I'll, explanation to that? I would say that we'd have to ask the mayor that question. But this is from the, the state. And ask the mayor to define that to the residents of the city of Gloucester. I think it's as simple as that. All right, Dylan. It's a great question, Councillor. And what I think, what from what I've seen as of August of this year, in my own in my own doing my own research, there were 16 grants, and then there's possibility some further grants that we could lose. And from what I saw, we could also there also could be a loss of a seawall grant. I want to learn more what else we could, and I'd like to have a discussion with you and others to say, what are we going to lose? That, I think, is a very important question to ask. Dan? Well, I, I regret to say I don't have a good answer for this question right now. Uh, I haven't been a city councilor, for example, uh, like some people have, and, and have uh, spent many months or years with its information, I, I wish I I wish I was better prepared from being city, serving on city council to answer that that question. Um, but I I do have to say that um, I I don't have much more to say. We're we're running up against I think the end of our time. Uh, I know that my my family is expecting me home pretty soon. Uh, so that's all I have to say. Okay, Dan, Marjorie, do you have a um, comment? You know I uh, you know the possibility of losing grants it all falls down into again there is so much um, mis misinformation disinformation confusion where there's no place where anybody can go and and read something or hear something or talk to somebody that gives you clear concise answers to the questions that are being asked and I think that that we will never get past these arguments until people can understand everything and you know when you've got people on this side with talking points and people on this side with you know fighting about this or fighting about that it we we are cutting our nose off to spite our face so to speak because we are not communicating with each other we're yelling at each other <coughs> thank you marjorie frank um yes the it's a mandate it's got to happen and um <laughs> you know whether it's three million um, $50 or whatever the grant is, it's important to have this grant money to help um, Gloucester. And it's a complex issue, and there's multiple pages that goes with the 3A. So, and things are constantly changing. So it's just getting the information, getting the facts, which is important, and working together with our state officials. Thank you. Thank you. Scott? I'd like to, I particularly appreciate what Marjorie just said, but I think it's important for us to not fight amongst ourselves, but to work together. Right. And that's true as a city, and it's, just, it's equally true for the city of Gloucester working with the state of Massachusetts. And we have a collaborative, positive relationship between the mayor's office and our uh, Senator Tarr and, and Representative Van Margaret and Beacon Hill and the governor. And I think if you look back in time, the state has helped us fund the boulevard the seawall of the back shore, Stage Fort Park, um, the Gemolero playground on, on, um, down on the fort. Uh, there are all kinds of infrastructure to the harbor that ha we've been eligible for uh, because it's municipally owned land and the state has kicked in. Uh, Carolyn Kirk has directed a lot of resources to, to the city. So it's important that our mayor, with our support, work with our elected officials at the state house to channel these funds and work constructively and proactively together, not to get into an argument and fight and waste time. Thank you very much. All right, we, oh boy, oh, 
Ooh. What is it? There's three. Oh. We're, what time? What time is it? It's 8 o'clock. You guys want to do one more question? Or you want to I heard Dan say that he has obligations. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I guess people that do have questions for the panel maybe can stick around, but they are going, we are going to shut it down, and there is a one minute closing statement. Dylan, you're the next one up. <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry, that was just the, the format. Huh? No? Yeah. Dylan, you have one. Closing, or are we not we, gonna do closing? Yes, we're okay. absolutely yeah, no, gonna I do know, closing. I know, I know. Dylan, thinking. you're next up. We no. each have one minute. Well, thank you. I wanna thank again for Clayton and the Cape Ann Political Action Committee for having this forum, for everyone that came out tonight on a Thursday evening. I also wanna thank my worthy opponent and everyone else here on this stage for participating. There is a fear out there that our city is losing its unique character, its unique history, and its unique culture. My vision for Ward 2 is a place where we preserve our history, our neighborhoods, and make common sense decisions for all of Ward 2. I believe I am qualified to be your next Ward 2 city councilor, and I hope to earn your vote on November 7th. And if you don't, have, if you don't live in Ward 2, tell your friends in Ward 2. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dylan. Dan. I just want to say uh, thank you for everybody for coming out tonight. Uh, thank you to the other candidates for putting in the time and effort to take for, to run for city council, and uh, even more those who serve on city council, both uh, the ones uh, sitting here and the ones in the audience who have spent that time. Uh, and I just want to say that you know I think that Dylan and I actually share a lot of views about how Gloucester can proceed to. Uh, keep its heritage, to preserve it, as well as to develop well in the future uh, as a place for families, as a place for young people, as a place for seniors. Um, and I really enjoyed having him uh, as, a, as an opponent in this race. I think we both did a great job. And I will be personally, as a War II resident, just as happy uh, if he is elected or if I am elected uh, on Tuesday. So thank you, Dylan, and thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Marjorie. Um, I, I hope um, as you leave here tonight that you leave knowing each of us a little bit better. Um, you know, it's you, the residents, who matter the most. And whether you want change or you want the status quo, it's up to you to make the decisions that are best for you. Um, I want to wish my fellow candidates good luck, and I applaud each and every one of you for running a considerate and polite campaign. Um, you know, I've learned a lot through this process, and it's been very eye-opening. And uh, uh, a lot of the people that have reached out to me in support have been people that I have not aligned with politically, but they've been very kind, and it has shown me that it is possible for both sides to work together. It is possible um, if you communicate. Um, you know, get involved, stay informed, and please be kind to one another. Um, voting is your number one tool to have your voice heard. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Um, thank you, for, um, everyone, for um, showing up here, and for um, everyone here on stage um, for running, um, either for a re-election or um, election. It's, it's, a, it's a great privilege that we have in this country to be able to do this. I'm running for Ward 4 Counselor because I care about the community. I care about Gloucester. I moved back here because I love this city, and I want to see the city grow, and I want to city, see the city stay where it is, and I love the city. Um, one thing, um, being the Ward 4 counselor is, I like to listen to all the people. I go door to door, listen to everyone, and I don't care which side you're on, I care about your voice. And I'm running because your voice matters. Thank you. Thank you. Scott? Uh, I would echo Dan's comment that our uh, Ward 1, Ward 2, and Ward 4 constituents would be very lucky with any one of us serving, and they, we're, we're blessed that we have good choices. I am proud of my recent comp contributions to helping our Ward 1 community. We have a fantastic new elementary school for Ward 1, which my granddaughter attends. We have finally addressed summer beach traffic with online reservation systems, which I advocated for early on. In Ward 1, we have repaved Hart Street, Harrison Avenue, Bass Avenue, Thatcher's Road, and Mount Pleasant Avenue, which has a newly replaced water and sewer, water and gas infrastructure. 
and I have worked very closely with residents to repave some of our worst private roads through our Betterment Paving prog Program, Starknot Heights and Oxford Road, eight streets around Briar Neck and Salt Island, Souther Road. We have made a start to improve the busily traveled private ways of Beach Road and Brightside. And after seven years, ten abutters on Haskell Court will now finally have reliable water service, water, private water service, and soon a repaved roadway. And I have to tell you, these are not easy tasks. They take a lot of time and a lot of follow through. I look forward with you to the new YMCA's new affordable senior housing downtown, to a new Gloucester Lyceum and Sawyer Free Library, which is such an important investment for our families and our children for generations to come. I value the unique beauty of our neighborhoods, the quality of education in our schools, and our city's cultural richness. I respect our taxpayers and their precious tax funding for all our municipal infrastructure and services. Thank you. We have you. a beautiful city. <laughs> Let's take care of it together with true Gloucester pride. Thank you. Thank you. Marianne, last but not least, yes. Again, I would like to thank all of the organizers, 1623 Studios, the attendees, the candidates sitting on either side of me this evening, and all those who have supported me. I ran a campaign not to fundraise, but instead to serve the people. I chose not to accept donations. That money is better served in the hands of the residents to pay their household expenses. I want to take this opportunity to thank each of you for your generosity and your willingness to help my campaign. I am passionate about our city, its people, and participate regularly at city and school committee meetings every week. I believe my experiences, active involvement each week, attending multiple meetings makes me a qualified candidate to represent Ward 1 and serve the people of the city of Gloucester. I've done some of the work and I would love to the opportunity to have a seat on the council where I can effectively make a difference. I look forward to hearing from others and I work, will work hard for each of you. Like my signage states, this is where my passion meets my purpose. And I do want to say that on the first day that I took out nomination papers, I received a call from Scott, and we made a promise to each other to have a very civilized campaign. And I think that, that it's really important and critical for all of us, whether we are on that side of the table or this side of the table, to really have respect for one another. I think that that, that shows uh, what Gloucester really is all about. So I ask for your vote on November 7th. I am Marianne Boucher, and I am first on the ballot. Thank you. All right, I do have a few words. I would like to thank Cape Ann Political Action Committee for inviting me back to a second moderating event. And finally, to the candidates. As an elected official in Manchester, I know how difficult this is, and it takes a lot of grit and um, good luck on November 7th. And I would like to just say to the whole audience, please take a look around your neighborhoods. If anyone's not able to get themselves to the polls, please lend a hand. Um, and finally, on the transit-oriented development, 40A, you know, we're in this together. This is Cape Ann Political Action Committee. So whatever happens, please, this is a Cape Ann issue. So please reach out to Manchester, Essex, Rockport. We all need to do this together. Thank you so much, everyone. Good luck.